Awesome. Okay. Didn't say recording, but we're good. Okay. Welcome everybody to conversation number 70. And we're welcoming first time presenter, which is hard to believe, uh, Johnny. Uh, Johnny is here to talk to us about testing stats and tell us what they do not mean and how we're all always um, getting it wrong. So thank you so much, Johnny, for joining us. Um, before we get started, uh, we want to take a moment to thank our sponsors. As always, let's start by thanking Conductrix, our first time OG sponsor. Uh, they've been here since the beginning. Mate, uh, Nat, the Matt, let's just join them together, Matt and Nate uh, and Ezekiel. Uh, thank you so much for sponsoring the TLC. We love you so much. Thank you. Uh, Ronnie Kahavi, who's been so gracious to offer a $500 discount to TLC members to the very popular uh, Accelerating Innovations class. Um, there is a link to the class, which I am going to put in the um, TLC Calls channel right there. And for those who can't reach it, I will also put it in the Zoom. That class is now uh, taking... Um, registrations for uh, February because it's currently the December class is currently running right now. Um, also, I want to welcome and thank again our TLC Connector newsletter sponsor, EPO. Thank you so much, sponsors. We could not do it without you. We really, really appreciate it. Um, next. Of course, I want to introduce Johnny. Um, Johnny is on a mission to help businesses understand how to leverage the power of experimentation. He is well known. If you haven't checked out LinkedIn, first of all, you need to follow Johnny because it is so entertaining. He shares unexpected experimentation results, but more importantly, he's known for telling us all just how wrong we are, and that's why he's here today. So I'm going to stop share, pass it over to you, and let's hope your screen share works really, really well. So off to you. Yeah, let me just follow that. Looks good. You want to go full screen, see if that? Yeah. Perfect. Great. Um, so I've changed, I think I've probably changed the name of the talk since I came up with it. <clears throat> um, and this actually is a, a sort of a springboarded from a, a LinkedIn post that I did a while ago, which is said this in it. Nobody actually understands experimentation statistics. So uh, I'll tell you what I mean by that or what I'm going to cover. Uh, so... Thank you, Kelly, for introducing me. Um, very brief additional introduction. I uh, currently run a uh, agency, or a, rather a team within an agency. So we're called Journey Further. We're a performance marketing agency. I run the digital experience division, and we mostly do retained conversion optimization, experimentation program management for clients. I do a lot of management consultancy. That's mostly what I do. So I work with some very big organizations, helping them understand strategy and scaling experimentation and stuff like that. <clears throat> um, because I am going to be talking about statistics, I wanted to give a little bit of a more detailed background around my history of involvement in statistics. So I am, I am, I've never professed to be a statistician. I'm actually not even that good at maths, really. Um, but I have worked with stats for a very long time. So before I got into digital, for about 10 years before I got into digital, I was in the field of what was then database marketing analytics. Um, most people would probably call that data science these days, but that wasn't a term that existed back then. So that is things like propensity modeling, segmentation, geographic information systems, stuff like that, basically, for like database marketing. So in those days, um, I was a consultant and I would help people understand why they would need things like that and then would I was like a kind of a solutions consultant that would help build them. So I didn't actually build them. I worked with statisticians. And then I got into digital and then I got into the world of experimentation and digital analytics. And all the way along 
that journey, I would say the way I would describe myself is a kind of a translator, really. So on the one hand, you have businesses who need to use this sort of stuff. And on the other hand, you have statisticians and people who really, really understand the nitty gritty of it. And out of the box, those two things can't really talk to each other. So back in those days, you know, I would work with uh, statisticians who were working in SaaS and things like that. And you literally couldn't put one of those people in a room with a client. It would be a disaster. Um, so you'd, you know, you'd need somebody who sort of translated, who would understand the business requirements, work with the statistician, bring something back. And that's, that's the sort of history that I've got. And today that's kind of still the same. Like I, um, I understand statistics to uh, probably a higher degree than a lot of people, but there's a, there's a wall where like um, I can't really be bothered to go into the really, really detail of it. But, I probably represent um, most people in the industry. And that's one of the things that I want to talk about today. Um, so what I'm actually going to talk about, I'm not actually talking to you about statistics. I'm not going to try and explain anything about statistics. I'm talking about um, people's understanding of and use of and attitude towards statistics. So the post that I put on LinkedIn was really based on an observation that the vast majority of people I talk to, to do with experimentation, A-B testing, actually have no understanding whatsoever of statistics. But on some level, I would say not very many people do at all. And even the people who really, really understand it um, often don't agree or, or often don't necessarily understand the business application of it. So... There's a lot of different sort of confusing attitudes and uses of statistics. And that's really what I want to talk about as a problem in our industry. And, and the reason is I want to just inspire sort of discussion and around and sort of thinking around solutions. But what I'm not doing is saying this is definitely the answer. I don't have the answer. So um, this is really just about sort of inspiring people to think about this in a particular way. So what I'm going to do is just is just start by going through some of the challenges that I see and just my experience of why this sort of is a difficult area. And exactly as Kelly said, like, you know, feel free to just jump in wherever. I'm not going to keep an eye on the chat because I can't keep looking at the chat. So, um, you know, if you if you have a burning desire to ask me something, please just butt in. Or uh, if anyone sees anything like really pertinent in the chat that somebody else has put, please let me know and we'll just go through it then. Or if you want, you know, you can leave it to the end. There's probably about 25 minutes of material here. So we'll have time at the end to talk about questions as well. So <clears throat> this, I would say, is the sort of main issue, really, is that, you know, for the layperson, for most people, not even just the layperson, but for most people, um, statistics is a sort of a never ending rabbit hole, really. Like um, over the years, I have on many occasions sort of decided to myself that I was going to properly learn about it and learn everything about it. And, you know, I, to, to an extent, I've done that from times. I've, you know, even despite the fact that I'm not massively mathematically, um, you know, minded. I've, you know, really sort of gone through reading about statistics and things like that. But the problem, I think, is that you don't go, all oh, right, I know it now. That's fine. It just basically opens more door, like, you know, it just opens more problems. Like the more you learn, the more nuance you learn about and the more problems that opens up. And it just, it kind of gets more and more complicated. And the vast majority of people are not even going to get that far whatsoever. They're just going to sort of go, oh, I wonder what this statistics thing is. Oh, that looks awful. I'm not going to have anything to do with that. And so the vast majority of people just run away from it entirely um, because uh, as uh, Ronnie, I know you posted things before. There's a, a really nice quote of something like, I'm going to get it wrong, but it's something like there is no simple explanation of it. I can't remember the exact quote, but it is this, that's the, sort of the perfect thing is that, you know, you cannot just sort of chunk it into this really simple thing that like everybody can understand. It just, it just isn't possible. And that's part of the problem is that the vast majority of people just, just go no and run away. And so you have this sort of really wildly different, different experiences where like, you know, in that rabbit hole, like 
you've you've genuinely genuinely got people doing this at the top like this is not an exaggeration i come across this all the time where there are people running tests that are doing stuff like this going you know we've literally you know got like two more orders and that's like a 200 percent increase in conversion or you know in this case 100 percent increase in conversion and that is not an exaggeration i see that a lot um and you know, there are obviously more subtle gradients of that where like you can think you're doing it right, but that's ultimately what you're doing. And then at the oppo opposite end of the scale, you've got like, you know, people really, really in the weeds of it who then sort of think, you know, actually like, unless you really, really understand it, you shouldn't be doing it at all. And like, you know, there's all sorts of things you can do wrong, which, you know, I completely believe. Um, But at the end of the day, you know, like, if you think of our industry, our A-B testing industry, there's some really different things going on. And I think, in a way, the other the other complexity is that it, literally everybody on this call, by the nature of the fact that they're on this call, will sit in a very sort of niche area that's towards the bottom of this funnel. But there are swathes and swathes of people who just don't are not bothered, right? And I think... Uh, particularly so we're like you know i work in a performance marketing agency and so we have clients that we're running experimentation programs for and as we've got bigger those clients are bigger and they're more mature and you know people understand it to an extent but i go and talk to like our ppc clients and our seo clients and they might sometimes they're quite big clients but you have people in marketing teams in those companies who have they've just got you know they've got a b tasty or something and they just they run an occasional test and they are, they're the ones doing this thing at the top. They don't care. And there are loads and loads of them. And, and it's easy for us to sort of sit in this bubble and think, well, actually, all the people we work with understand it. But there are tons of people out there who absolutely don't understand it whatsoever. So, um, and then, yeah, I've mentioned that the experts don't agree. And now this post that I did, I got into a conversation with Georgie and Ronnie. And um, now both of these books are great. And there's no, there's absolutely no question that either of them is wrong or one of them is right. It's just a different interpretation. But the conversation we got into was about this idea of low statistical significance. So Georgie Georgiev has a tool called Analytics Toolkit. And you can run a test in that. So you, it has what's called a, a risk reward calculator in it. And uh, I can very legitimately plug in some numbers to that about a test I'm running and what it costs to run the test and what it costs to build. And it will say that I can run that test at 60% statistical significance. Um, and Georgie also wrote, I can't find it actually, but he wrote a, a blog article ages ago about how running a test at 50% statistical significance is completely valid. And meanwhile, Ronnie, you know, you have in your book it's very different. Like in some of the stuff that you present is about how, um, you know, anything less than ninety-five percent statistical significance is not acceptable because actually most of the time the decisions you're making are wrong. Now, like I say, not I genuinely. Uh, I, I, don't I'll just say I think the word "never" is not what I said. I think you're making it extreme. I said in many scenarios where learning is important and where false positive have a large impact you want to go with the higher confidence intervals and I show this table of false positive risk. So you're a little bit making it into the extreme here, but I'll let you go on. But it, yeah, but it's, but the, the fact is they are very, very different interpretations. Now it's not, it, the thing is, it's not just a nuanced interpretation. It has very different implications for how somebody like me would take that information and run a business run you know an experimentation program according to it and there are sort of political ramifications in a way like your your um you know the implications of your view is as you've said in different posts that you know actually only really large organizations should run testing and that volume you know is really really critical george's view is much more based on the idea that actually as long as you understand the risk anybody can run a test and you know and those are just different things so i'm not i'm absolutely not picking on one or the other as right or wrong at all i'm just saying they are different applications of the statistics to different understanding of how you would run a business which brings me on very nicely to this which is that there's this ultimate problem that um 
you know, the world of statistics and the world of business are two very fundamentally different things that don't necessarily match. And I've got an analogy from my previous days, which is why I was talking about my sort of old career in offline data analytics, because um, you, I mean, some of the people on this call will be aware of this, but you can in that world build what's called cluster segmentations in database um, in databases. So, you know, you might do that, like you might have a database of customers with various different attributes around them, and you can build a segmentation of how they sort of group into different uh, meaningful groups that you can market to. And you do that with generally with something called K-means clustering. And um, I don't know if you care, but I think your phone went to sleep. It oh, killed the video. All oh, right. Sorry. Yeah, my my webcam broke completely, and so I've just, and then I just literally figured out that you could use the phone as a webcam. Yeah. Um, uh, I mean, it doesn't. It's really okay with us. I just wanted you to know. Yeah. It, that may or may not work. Ah, technology. There you go. Um. You were talking about payment. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. So um, basically, um, yeah, you you get like you have a client, you know, like I know I'm, I'm, I've got one in my mind. I had this this kind of a very big motor insurance company, and they wanted to build this marketing segmentation to talk to people differently. And so you get the data, you give it to a statistician, and they will run K-means clustering algorithm, and typically the first thing that ever comes back is the most sort of statistically beautiful algorithm that in clustering, but it is totally meaningless and unusable as a marketing device. And the problem is, is that you have to blend these two things where, um, you know, what, what you need to do from a marketing point of view is driven by all sorts of things that, can't be purely driven by the statistics and a, and a statistician has no business acumen whatsoever they don't understand the um use of these sorts of things and why you would use them and you know all that sort of stuff so the two worlds don't really mix and, and and where you get you know the sweet spot is where you've got somebody who can understand both the statistics and the business application of it and to both Ronnie and George's absolute credit, that is what they have done. They're just different. They're just slightly different applications of it. But, you know, mo you, it, you know, completely converse opposite of that is you will have businesses who have like a, da a data science team and they're like completely in the weeds of data science and just don't even think about the business application of things at all. And so like there's nobody translating between them. But that to me is one of the issues is that, you know, the, the perfect application of the statistics and the perfect knowledge of the statistics doesn't necessarily work from a business point of view of how, you know, you're trying to use it and how these business decisions are supposed to be made. So that kind of gets missed in a lot of places, um, but it is really important. So, I mean, this is just something I use with clients to try and explain why it's important. This is a real genuine test. I mean, I'm not going to go through this a lot of detail because I'm sure the people on this call don't need this sort of education, but this is a real genuine test. It is an AA test. So I, I use this with clients to go, what do you think about this? And they'll go, oh, well, you know, it's quite a big uplift and 85% confidence seems pretty good. So, um, you know, like seems like a, a winner. And then I'll say, well, no, it's an AA test. So that's sort of, you know, designed to demonstrate the fact that if you are ignoring statistics completely, even though you can look in your AB testing tool and get this confidence number, then actually, you know, it it doesn't necessarily mean anything. You could be like a, a false positive. So it is important. And then the other thing is, I mean, I know Google Optimize doesn't exist anymore. Um, but this is Google Optimize, I don't I don't think anybody really knew how it works, but it was quite weird. Like and this is this is a real genuine test that we ran where like after three weeks it did this thing of going you have a leader deploy the leader and you've literally got a button that like you can push it to 100 percent. and this is the same test in analytics toolkit of george's toolkit and 
that is the same point after three weeks where it is just simply nowhere near powered at all. And after another, um, you know, six, seven weeks, it's actually like, you know, a negative and, um, you know, completely different. So, you know, I personally think that most of the vendors have either knowing, like knowingly and willingly kind of slightly ignored the need for statistics or even perhaps deliberately, you know, uh, ignored it. But, you know, for most of the vendors, it's it's kind of been in their interest that people are finding lots of winning tests and having a really nice time and, you know, that sort of stuff. And actually trying to say to them, no, you need to, you need to calculate sample sizes and you need to do this, that, and the other just really overcomplicates the proposition. Um, so that's, that's the other thing that's sort of really confused the area is that the vast majority of people using AB testing tools believe that you just need to look at that statistical significance number. And if it goes to 96% after one day, then that's fine. And then it's a winner, right? Because that's what it's telling you. So um, that's, you know, a lot of what I find with the people I talk to, they, you know, if, if they're looking at that at all, that's what they think. And obviously that's not necessarily the case. So really there's, there's kind of this big kind of question of to what extent does it actually matter? I mean, you know, it clearly does matter, but there's so many people out there not caring and not, not using it at all. Um, that I don't know. The, the big question in my mind is like, is there such a thing as like a level of just, you know, doing it a bit, which is still okay. Or is it really that actually, you know, we have a real significant problem with all these people that are not doing it properly. So, um, yeah, the next thing I was just going to do is like, uh, just a bit more on my experience of the different kinds of people that I come across and the different sorts of people that are using AB testing. I don't know if anyone had any other thoughts or questions on that first bit of just the general problem before I do that. This is the point where you all get to actually interrupt and ask questions, or you can put them if over you, in the CLC If vault. you want to. Yeah. Still can't get my camera working. Never mind. Yeah, no worries. Um, uh, people are posting comments, but they're mostly comments. Uh, Nick said we need a whole talk on tool stats, which is absolutely true. Oh, what, is, what do you mean, Els, about nine weeks, just that it took that long? Yeah, it seems like a, a long time to, to run a test for. Yeah, well, that that happens when you don't have large sample sizes. Yeah, I mean that's that is a sequential testing technique that is, you know, collecting the data until it reaches one conclusion or another. Yep. So, uh, I mean, that's an yeah, interesting. That's that's an interesting. Yeah, that's an interesting separate topic because, uh, you know, there there is a school of thought that says, you know, the longer you run a test, the more sample pollution you get, but you know, if you if you don't have large sample sizes, you kind of have to. So, yep. I'll let you know if uh, any questions come through. People are typing, okay. and I'll interrupt you. If right. you really don't mind, I'll interrupt. So, caveat on this, like it says, is just completely purely my opinion. I sit with one perspective on the market from the people I talk to. It will be different to other people's perspectives. Uh, I haven't actually done a survey. It's completely my like anecdotal view of like the people that I talk to. But I just wanted to give a few examples of some of the people that I come across just to kind of give a, a, a range of like what is the issue. Um, I've got a weird animation effect here, but... So this is this is this is real. Like I actually did a, I did a, um, a webinar probably about six months ago when I was and I, it wasn't really about statistics, but one part of it was about statistics. And a lady in the chat said pretty much exactly this. It's not word for word, but she was the head of experimentation for a very big organization in the United States. And I'm not going to name any names at any point in this call. It wouldn't be fair. But she was the head of experimentation for a big financial services organization in the U in the US. And she said pretty much exactly this, which was, we don't bother with statistical significance. We just see the effect in the numbers and the trend. And I would say that is the most common 
thing that I come across with the companies that I talk to. And that they can be big or like that, or they can be small. But you genuinely would have a lot of people who just go, we've run this test for a bit, like a week, and this one's got a higher conversion rate. So that's the winner. And they don't have they don't look at the statistical significance or care what it is. They think it's all a bit kind of geeky and like extra. So they just don't bother. And that is, you know, alarmingly common, I would say, that people do that. Um, yeah. So, uh, and again, you know, like, it's quite hard for a lot of people to believe that. But, you know, the fact, the nature of the fact that everybody's on this call and on these Slack channels and things like that means you you are by default in a particular bubble in the mar in the market where you won't necessarily come across those people, but they're there. There's lots of them. So, you know, that, that is like one of the biggest problems is that, you know, there are tons and tons of people out there who just don't care. Um, th this, this is very similar, but like, I, this was a, a, a company that I consulted with a long time ago and they had a in-house experimentation team who had been running tests for a good like couple of years at this point and they just because of where they were situated they were in this sort of trading merchandising trading team in the like e-commerce area marketing area and they had these sort of daily trading targets and so their whole experimentation operation was was based around the idea that you could move the needle on things on a day-to-day -day basis so they would run tests. They would particularly run tests in the morning on things um, and then push those things live. Like that's that's the whole basis of what they were doing was they would they would have these ideas, they'd get them set up. And then like in the first thing in the morning, they'd run these ideas for like literally like two hours and then go, right, that's the winner and push it live for the rest of the day because that's going to make us more sales for the rest of this particular day. And this is a big company that was doing this. And uh, so, you know, and if you, when you actually look into those, I mean, they had quite a lot of volume, but nevertheless, like, you know, they've got very, very small sample sizes. And I mean, you actually dig into this, sometimes there'd be like one order different in exactly that kind of crazy example I provided. Um, back to this, you know, this is like, and I mean, although it doesn't exist anymore, you know, huge, huge proportion of the market using stuff like Google Optimize who just go, oh, well, it said it's a winner, so it is. Um, no idea how that works. I never did work it out. And they don't tell you. Um, and then opposite of that, so another client that I'm working with at the moment, they have uh, all sorts of people around the business running tests in different platforms. They've got an A-B testing platform, but there's other people running tests like server-side and things like that. And then they have this data science team and anybody who runs a test has to submit the results to the data science team and they produce the results of whether it was a winner or not. And they produce a report and there's a, they have a big backlog. So like you'll wait three weeks for that to happen. And most people don't run tests because of that, because they're, you know, they're like, can't be bothered. Um, but it's very much sort of ring fenced that nobody is allowed to make any kind of decision off the back of a test in the data science team. Um, and that's not that common, but it's, but it's, uh, you know, it's a different sort of alternative way of approaching it. Um, another, in this is a really interesting one. So this, this is actually exactly what a guy that I, so I've known this guy for a long time. I've known this guy since uh, my database marketing days. And he was a statistician at an insurance company. I think originally he was an actuarial statistician and then he became a marketing statistician. And um, and then now he does work in digital and he's very, very clever. And he has a PhD in statistics and he's very proficient in AV testing statistics. However, attitudinally, he thinks that it is all not really that worth bothering about. And he, he always says this, which is like, it's not medicine. It's not, you know, it's not um, anything where like, you know, people are going to die. Um, you know, you can, you know, think about it, but if you get it wrong, it doesn't really matter. That's what he always says. And that's quite an interesting viewpoint. Um, and actually, I, again, I'm not going to name names, but there's a guy who's, 
who is currently quite uh, key in our industry, and he has he has the same sort of opinion. Um, so you know, another another sort of different attitude. And then you've got the this sort of view, which is that um, you know, similar to the data science view, that it is so important and so nuanced that you know, and so easy to get wrong that only a real sort of elite of people should be should be doing it and everybody else sh just shouldn't bother or should guess or whatever. Um, so like super different opinions. And I would say you can kind of cut them like this, where there's a kind of an axis of like whether you care about it or not and whether you understand it or not, what your level of knowledge is. And there's four different kind of segments of people and like you know low care low knowledge is exactly that where like you know they'll just not even look at the statistics at all and go this one's got a higher conversion rate there you go um low care high knowledge is that thing that i talked about which is like nobody's gonna die it's like you know low a, a lot about it, but you don't really value the importance of it high care low knowledge is is probably you know probably a reasonably large segment there's you know, people who, I guess, I guess probably most of us would fall into that segment where you know you might like you know, and me, I, I understand the importance of it, um, and but I want you know somebody who can kind of help me with it or you know a tool that sort of does it to an extent. I mean, there's a massive spectrum of this. Like you know, these aren't four cliffs. Like, there's a huge spectrum of where you sit across this, and then the final one is like high care and high knowledge, which is you know, that sort of elitist kind of version of it. And uh, this is a wild guess, but I personally think that this would be how people split down. People doing A-B testing probably split down like this. And again, this is my perspective and just the kinds of people I talk to. I could be completely wrong. But, you know, if you think about, like, all of the people that would be using Google Optimize that have probably now moved on to Convert or something like that, or free tier on something else, you know, swathes and swathes of, like, e-commerce businesses that just occasionally run an A-B test, you know, most of them just won't care at all and don't understand it. So there's, like, large, large volumes of people doing that. Um, and... You know, you could kind of argue, well, just let them get on with it, whatever. Like, you know, uh, you know, we'll do it properly. But I think as an industry, you kind of have to care about what people are doing. And if and also if in reality there's like loads of people out there just like using false positives and not understanding how to do things, it doesn't do the whole industry any favors at all, because um, you know, that's why and then one of the really common things that I find is people run tests and then they, you know, they get a little bit more mature and they run more tests. And then somebody at some point will go, hang on a minute, you know, you've been running all these tests and saying that they're all like, you know, winning and making all this money, but we've never actually seen any impact on the, on the conversion rate. So I don't believe this anymore. And part of that is because you can't see impact on conversion rate. I mean, I've got a whole other kind of video on that. But part of it is to do with the fact that you have a lot of people just, you know, making erroneous decisions and they'd be better off just guessing in a way. So what do you do about that? So, and like I say, I don't have the answer at all. I'm just trying to kind of inspire an industry kind of thinking and discussion about like what you should do. So there are, there are ha and have been some attempts to solve the issue um, optimizely. So optimizely has a stats engine. Um, I actually think it's very good. Like, um, but, it, but interestingly, you know, the attempt there is that is just to completely remove all kind of um, all responsibility for it from the person doing the test. So they they obviously sat down and said, we don't want anybody calculating sample sizes. We don't want anybody worrying about MDEs. You know, we don't want any of that. We just want them to run tests and then get like a, a, a more of a robust answer. So it's kind of, it's very sort of honorable really. And I mean, you know, you can see the business logic behind it for them. And I, I like, I, in a way I think it's quite good, but the one of the problems for me is that actually understanding some of the parameters that go into designing a test is useful from a business point of view. 
at a bare minimum, like, you know, you could design a test and find that it's pointless because you'll never get this, the data to, you'll never get the sample size to actually make a decision. But in Optimizely, like, there's nothing to kind of warn you of that. You would just start running a test and it would just run forever. And then, you know, you, you go, like, oh, you know, maybe we'll run it a bit longer, run it a bit longer. Like, you, there's no, you don't understand the parameters of the sample size and things like that. Whereas if you did, if you were calculating your sample size in your MDE and things like that, you would, you would in a lot of cases, go, this is completely pointless. Because if I run it for eight weeks, I've got to prove a 40% uplifting conversion. So, you know, then then it helps people to understand the logic and the rationality of saying, well, actually, like, let's test on an upstream metric instead, or let's do this, that, or the other instead, you know. So there's some quite, you know, there's just useful business application of understanding some of the broad parameters in it. However, you know, again, it's sort of one possible solution. One possible solution is should the vendors take over all this? Should they sort of do it for you? Um, the uh, George's analytics toolkit now transparency as an agency we use this and have done for years. We run every test through it. That's what we use and find it you know matches our needs in terms of being able to sort of help with it, provide the right data to clients and things like that. I guess CXL calculator is a similar thing. You know, these, these you know, sort of try and find the balance of, you know, you do need to understand what's going on a bit, but you don't really need to understand, like, the absolute intricacies of p-values and all that kind of stuff. Like, it, you know, it's sort of a framework and a calculator that, you know, once you understand some of the basics and what's happening, it kind of does it for you. So, you know, that's one model. But then, you know, those people that I'm talking about who just don't care, you're not going to get them to use something like that. They, you know... Even even though it's relatively easy, it'd switch off straight away. So, um, you know, interesting. Um, there, some would argue that actually you just have to educate yourself. Like you just, you know, you should just that people should be educating themselves, and that perhaps it's the responsibility of vendors to push that agenda. That you know, like really, like if someone starts using an A/B testing tool, that the vendors should be pushing that agenda and and, and providing training properly and like almost kind of forcing people into that training so that they understand it and things like that. Um, and then you know, one of a sort of slightly slightly wilder uh, kind of version is that actually, really, when you think about it, controlled experimentation is only one type of val validation, and um, you know, it should sit within a suite of things that you might do in order to make decisions and that there's this sort of hierarchy of evidence around it. And, you know, we sh that you're kind of better off thinking about that. And, you know, you know, there's not one approach that's right for everybody, um, but those are some of the things that people have tried to do. So I guess in summary, what I'm just trying to do here is like present a bit of a survey of how I see the people in this industry and their different attitudes and ways of approaching statistics, some of the problems. And, you know, again, just to reiterate, you could just go, well, let them do it. Like, you know, I'm doing it right. Um, but, you know, it doesn't really do anybody any favors because one of the biggest problems, I mean, from, from my point of view, we sell experimentation as an agency. And one of the biggest challenges for me is that different people have the most wildly different perceptions of what experimentation is, how it drives value to the business, how to use it to drive decision making. You know, I mean, from at one end of the scale, you've got people who just think CRO is getting a list of best practices off the internet. And then the opposite end of the scale, you've got like, you know, people who like, have experimentation completely in their DNA and everything. And then there's loads of massive spectrum in between. And a lot of those, those weird perceptions come from strange things like the way it's sold by consultants. You know, in the past, you had this sort of no win, no fee thing and stuff like that. And that really polluted people's ideas of statistics because if you're going to sell on a no win, no fee basis, you don't really want people understanding statistics because there's no way they'd agree to it if they did. You know, things like that. So um the whole there's a lot of kind of confusion and clouding in the industry which comes from this sort of thing so yeah hopefully that's just a bit of inspiration as to how we as a community and as an industry 
need to think about this stuff. Any other questions or thoughts? Is that a raised hand to ask a question? That's a raised hand. Yeah. Can I ask a question? Oh, please do. <laughs> hey, this is Carrie. Uh, thanks, Johnny. This is great. Can you um, comment a little bit? I think you touched on it earlier um, about using data kind of beyond the conversion rate. Like a million years ago, we did a test that drove like tons of new bank account um, signups. And then we realized that creative was attracting a segment of people that actually didn't have any money. So they didn't put any money in the accounts. So it looked great, like all the way up to account opening. And then it, and then it kind of hit the wall. Like you, I'm sure you've seen other things like that. Can you just kind of comment on using it, things beyond the conversion rate? Yeah. So, I mean, I mean, one of the, one of the primary reasons that you would do that is because you've cannot achieve the right sample size for your conversion rate. So, you know, in an ideal world, when you're running testing, every test would be measured on the ultimate commercial metric, you know, the commercial goal. Um, and in most cases, that would be conversion rate. But for lots of businesses, their conversion rate is small and they don't get the traffic of, you know, they don't get a lot of traffic. So it's hard to get statistical significance on conversion rate for changes that they make and one of the obvious things that you can do is to test upstream uh you know so to use add to bag or something upstream even like click through from a banner or whatever and simply because that has a higher conversion rate then that means you need less sample size and um so that's a that's a valid thing to do if you can't get the sample size now one really important thing is that that does not necessarily prove the conversion rate. And in a lot of cases, you can, you know, if you measure all your tests on both things, you will see that there are lots of cases where you prove one thing and not the other thing, or, you know, the other, the other way around. So, and a really good example of that, like we have a, we have a client who sell windows and doors and their site is lead generation. And we, you can do all sorts of things to kind of, almost trick people into providing their details on a form. So one of the things they like to do is to say that you are getting a quote. So get a quote online. You're not getting a quote. You're requesting a callback from a really pushy salesperson. Um, but the more they say, you know, oh, get a quote, then people will fill in the form. But they're terrible quality of leads because they didn't, they don't want to buy windows. They're just looking for a cost. So like they don't ring, they don't answer the phone. They don't, you know, get a callback. So, that's just, you know, a clear example, but that happens all the time in the fact that you're, you know, just because you push somebody through a funnel doesn't mean they're the right kind of people. Um, but as long as you understand that risk, like this is the thing, like I think, you know, if you understand that risk and, the, and, you, can, and you can talk meaningfully about that risk in the business, then that's fine. And the other thing is that conversion rate is an upstream metric anyway. So you'll, you'll never get the proper downstream metric because conversion rate is an upstream metric because below that really you should have average revenue per user, but that's an upstream metric because the absolute bottom, bottom, bottom line metric would be EBITDA per actual customer. And you can't get that, right? So like not EBITDA per user, EBITDA per actual customer. And that's impossible to get. So that is the most downstream metric. So any metric you're measuring is upstream anyway. And there's always risk to everything. So you just have to understand that risk. Um, but I personally think uh, providing you understand all that is completely valid to um, measure things on more upstream metrics when you have to. I think if you can, you know, you, we, I get a lot of clients who they will, they think, you know, well, actually we're trying to, we're trying to imp, uh, influence UX. So we'll measure this on just this, whether they've engaged with this and, and that, you know, actually they could have got a significance on conversion rate. They just not haven't tried. So I think like, you know, you go to the lowest type of metric down the funnel that you possibly can, but if you have to, you go up the funnel, if that makes sense. Cool, thanks. Anyone else? You're right, Eddie. Kelly Britton has a question in the chat. Yeah. Oh, I see it. Uh, Brittany asks, thoughts on small scale testing to look at user interactions to validate larger scale testing? Uh, absolutely, yeah. I mean, like, so 
uh, I've, I've written all sorts of other things on this concept, but, um, you know, I, I personally believe that um, CRO as a thing is a little bit limited because it tends to work on the basis of you just got this list of stuff and like, you know, you're either testing it to really do it or not. It's very binary. Actually, to me, like testing should be this cost, constant iterative process. And, <clears throat> you know, you, every idea that you have, you should be validating in some way, shape or form in a way that makes it efficient from a cost point of view. So, you know, a, a really good example of that is, you know, is quite a, a, a cliched example, but um, uh, painted door testing on payment vendors. So, you know, should you put Klarna on the website? Um, now, you can't, like, really, if you want to test that, you've got to go and integrate Klarna and sign up to it and integrate with your finance systems and all that kind of stuff. Um, by the time you've done that, you might as well just put it on, right? But actually, a painted door test is... Um, you know, you just put the logo on the site and go, you know, click this. And then when it says, sorry, this isn't available right now, when you measure how many people click it and drop off and all that sort of stuff. And that, like, you know, you're not really going to do that. You're just gathering data. And that example that you've given is exactly that. So there's loads of places where you can test to sort of validate a bigger concept. And you don't, in a way, you don't really need to be so worried about statistical significance and things like that in those instances, because you it's a form of research rather than a, you know, a, an experiment to then make a decision as to something to go and actually put on your site and risk, you know, any the exposure to the customer. So yeah, that's another really good way of of sort of spreading risk by, you know, doing the smallest possible thing that you can first and then iterating into bigger things. Brittany says, thanks. Great insight. Scrolling back through to see. Um, Merritt said, uh, thinking about the we don't use stats company, can you actually say without knowing lots of specifics about their testing practice that it's a bad strategy for them? It's a good point. No, that's the whole point of this presentation. That is actually the entire point of this presentation. I don't have the answer to all of this. Uh, you know, I've got my opinion, but I don't have the answer. And really, like, you know, that's the, that's the question in the back of my mind is like, if somebody does that, maybe that's okay. Maybe like, maybe, you know, especially if they've got enormous volumes, right? Maybe in the vast majority of cases, those inferences they make about the conversion rate being higher would, would kind of be statistically significant anyway. You know, so... I don't know. Like this is this is the this is the thing. This is this is what this presentation is about. Like, and there are very different um, interpretations of it. And that that is, you know, that that friend that I have that was saying like nobody's going to die. That is that's basically what he was. What his attitude was was that like you know you could just you can just tie yourself in knots worrying about it and actually you know just do it and it's fine. You know so. Um, there's uh, there's no right or wrong to way to do anything that I've said. Like, or you know, different people have got different opinions. So yeah, yeah. It it feels it reminds me a little bit of um you know the the test and roll strategy um uh, that Dr. Ellie Fight recommends, where you kind of start um, the experiment and monitor, and then you know they did a whole bunch of analysis around whether or not you could, you know, monitor and then be like, yeah, that looks good enough. <laughs> and they saw that if you, they, they have a calculator out there that shows that you could actually call it early. Um, I think it's Bayesian based. Um, I'd have to go back. I haven't read the paper in a while, um, but it's pretty interesting. Um, maybe somebody else remembers if that's the case, um, but I'll post the link in the TLC calls channel. Uh, Matt says, if the question is, can simple heuristics likely be effect? I think he means effective then, of course, but not by the low care, low knowledge terms. Um, want to remind everybody, you have a few more minutes if you want to ask questions, but I want to remind everybody about our call in, I think, two weeks. Um, 
let's see the date. The date is January 12th, so more than two weeks. Uh, GA4 for analysis and experimentation, bear traps for the unwary. Um, we're finally going to be talking about hyperlog log as well as other uh, situations with Google Analytics 4 and analyzing your data and BigQuery and all that fun stuff. It'll be Craig Sullivan and Oliver Patton. So January 12th. Uh, so the next time we chat, it will be after the new year, which is hard to believe. Um, so, um, oh, Merritt says, just want to say I'm a huge Johnny London fan. Speaks clearly, concisely, and wisely. All with a nice accent. Aw. <laughs> Thank you, Merritt. Ditto. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about his accent, but I guess we'll allow it. <laughs> uh, and Justin says he loves your posts. Yeah. Um, Sorry which... for telling everybody they're wrong. It, it's, uh, it's a strategy. It's like I try to be just slightly controversial enough that like it might just ever so slightly rile people enough to, for them to like look at it without it actually being wrong so even though it seems like i'm a bit negative like you wouldn't ever really be able to point it and go i'm actually trying to offend anybody that's that's the content strategy so. <laughs> <laughs> just enough to get people to say what, what? yeah exactly it's fun it's <laughs> fun and it's not it's not rude it's fun no, so it's i enjoy it Matt Gershoff says, I am offended. <laughs> of course he is. <laughs> yeah, but you're our loving curmudgeon, Matt. <laughs> He's offended by everything. Anyway, this this was so much fun. We had a great time. Thank you so much, Johnny. We really appreciate it. And for those of you uh, that will be waiting for uh, the recording, as soon as it's done processing, it'll be posted as always, both on the TLC YouTube and on the TLC Slack recording channel. Johnny, would you be willing to share your slides? Of course, yeah. Awesome. So if you want the slides, the slides will be shared as well. Thank you so much, Johnny. We really appreciate it. And if anybody has extra questions, you can post those on the TLC calls and Johnny will hop over and answer. Thank you, everybody. Have a great weekend. Have a great holiday season. Happy New Year. Take care. Bye, all. Bye now. Bye-bye.